wow. <laughs> the day has come. It's an honor to preach to the Metro Calls. And for those who don't know, my name is Edie. And me and my husband, we recently took over the leadership of the Mighty West region. And I'm so excited to preach to you all today. And it's awesome because I got the idea for my lesson actually thanks to Elena. <laughs> she asked me like, what is something you're passionate about? Who is a person like you love in the Bible? And I got it. It's Miriam. So we're gonna have a little lesson on Miriam today. And she was actually the very first prophetess in the whole Bible. So, let's turn to Micah chapter 6. So we're going to get started. In Micah 6, verse 4, it says, I need this. Micah 6, verse 4. It says, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. So I love this scripture. The Israelites were enslaved to Egypt for so, so long. And God sent Moses, also Aaron, but, and Miriam. It was not complete without Miriam. God's trio, this leadership group, but God's plan. So the title of my lesson today is, it's not complete without you. It's not complete without you. And I just love the way that God honors women in the Bible. You know, especially back in a time period where the world didn't do that. God honors them and he loves them so much. So are you guys ready to dive into Miriam's life? Okay, my first point is complete courage complete courage. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. We're just going to dive into it. So I'm like a, I love the amens. I love the let's go sis. I love the, hey, what was that scripture again? <laughs> I have an accent. So if you don't understand me, just be like, what? And I'll say it in American. I got my accent down. <laughs> But let's go to Exodus chapter 2. And we're going to start off in verse 1, complete courage. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, he hid, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got the pyrus basket. For, he, for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. Just like those babies in the back. I hope they're okay. <laughs> um, but she was, he was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So in this time period, it was crazy. It was really crazy. The Pharaoh of Egypt, I was going to say Prince of Egypt, but that's a movie. But the Pharaoh of Egypt made a decree to kill all the newborn baby boys. All of them. Well, from the, from the Israelites at that time. And Moses' mom kept him for three months. And in Hebrews 11, it talks about how, he, how she did this out of faith. And because he knew, she knew that Moses was a special child and she kept him. 
but she kept him to the point where she couldn't keep him anymore. Um, I don't have kids, but I know they cry a lot after three months especially. So that would have been really hard. And the Bible says that she placed him in the riverbank of the Nile. And in verse 4, it says, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And the Bible later reveals to us that this sister, Moses' sister, was in fact Miriam. Was Miriam. But I was diving into it, and I found a really cool little thing. And Miriam is actually the old word for Mary. And we know that the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament. And in Matthew 27, at the account of the cross, it talks about how Mary also stood at a distance and watched. And I thought about it. There must be a correlation. And I thought about what is similar between these two accounts. Well, they were both in a breathtaking situation. Right? Imagine watching the cross. And you just feel all these fears, uncertainties of the future. You don't know what's to come. But then imagine being Miriam, watching and standing, not knowing whether your baby brother is going to make it. Not knowing whether your mom might or might not get caught putting the baby in and out, in the Nile. Or whether you're going to get caught. There's so much fear and uncertainty but also so much opportunity to show complete courage. There was also a lot more opportunity to probably show fear, but it took courage to stand at a distance and let God's will be done. That takes courage. Miriam could have like totally run away from this situation, physically, but also emotionally. She could have just shut down and not be attached, or she could have tried to like act on it and take control before the situation ended the way it did. You know, she could have like ran away or tried to run away with Moses and her mom. Or, which is where my mind went, she could have like dug a hole underground and made like a soundproof room so the baby could stay there forever. She could have done it. These are some options. I probably would have done that. But she understood that God was the one who needed to take control. She didn't put her trust in anything but God. And that, that takes courage. And courage means the ability to do something that frightens one. And if we're being real with ourselves, or it may just totally be me, and I'm just getting open, that's fine. I think as women, I'm going to get off. We'll just, it's a lot in there. I think as women, we can intellectually understand that we need to put our trust in God, but it can be hard, right? It can be really hard. And as women, our nature, we tend to want to take controls of the situation, either by acting too early or by shutting down. And there's been many parts of my life where I've done both, but especially before I became a disciple, I ran to just shutting down. I ran to numbing out. I didn't cry for three years before my cross study. I didn't feel anything. And I just ran to drugs. I ran to drinking. I ran to people liking me and feeling loved and validated from other people. Like, I ran to all these things. And I grew numb. And it wasn't until I started the Bible where I, I actually realized how hurt I was. Like, how much was in there. And I remember them asking me in the Bible studies, how are you feeling? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? Because no one ever asked that in the world. You know what I mean? Like, no one ever asked, hey, how are you really doing? It was more like, hey, how's your day? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So my response was like, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. But I wasn't. I really wasn't. And I quickly learned that it took courage to express how I'm really doing. Because if we let someone in, like really in, and if they see the real us, then we lose control of who we think we are and how we think we're doing. Because we fool other people, ladies, but we also fool ourselves by doing that. And in this world, I was just in the world, I was just trying to hold it together. I was just trying to go to dance class, 
get a job, graduate. I was trying to hold on to my mental state, hold on to my physical life. I was just trying to hold it all together. And I became so independent where I didn't even realize there was a God to need. I didn't even realize that. I just never thought about it. And the world preaches, and this was honestly my life motto, if you don't take care of yourselves, no one else will. But that's not true. That's not true, ladies. And Miriam, she knew that. She knew that wasn't true. Miriam knew that God was going to come through for her and for her family. Even though, this is crazy, even though Miriam herself has only ever experienced a life in slavery. This is all she ever knew. She probably saw tons of her friends' little brothers being killed. Maybe her cousins. Or maybe even just walking around and seeing the grieving of these mothers and of these family. That's what she grew up around. But she had the faith and the courage to understand that God was going to take care of her despite everything going on around her. She had the courage to act, but to act promptly, too. And when Miriam saw the Pharaoh's daughter feeling sorry for the baby Moses, she had the courage to go and talk to one of the most high-powered, talented people of her time. She had that courage. And I really believe she had that courage because courage trickles, right? If, you're, if you can do one thing courageous, whereas she, you know, she saw her, bro- her baby brother be put in the Nile, that's pretty courageous, right? So because she got through that, she can then do the next courageous act, which was then talking to the Pharaoh's daughter. And it goes on and on and on. It only takes one courageous act to make it trickle. And she did this because it was bigger than her. It's bigger than us. You know, this was bigger than just Miriam having the courage to surrender control to God. But this led to a whole nation being set free from slavery. That's what this act of courage led to. Because if Miriam didn't watch at a distance, being patient for God to work and not trying to jump in there on her own accord, And then act quickly, right? When God urged her, rather than not giving up hope, then we would have never had Moses, who took the Israelites to the promised land. Well, not to the promised land, but to the desert, out of Egypt. So I have a question for you today, ladies. What are you most fearful of? And I'm not talking about spiders or cockroaches or snakes, even though I totally understand all of those three. (laughs) But I want to talk about the deep stuff. What are you most fearful of? Is it not getting into your dream college or doing well in school because your worth is in that? Is it being cheated on? Is it lack of security? Is it fear of people seeing the real you and not liking you? It's going to be different for all of us, but what is that one thing you're fearful of? And my challenge for you is to write it down. Write down the one thing that you need courage to face. Then get open about it. Pray about it. But pray specifically whether God is calling you to stand and wait or to promptly act. Because there's a difference. We can either swing two ways in the different situations, right? And we saw Miriam was an incredible example of how to do it right in both. But if we're fearful, we like to, like, go and take control and, like, make sure nothing ever hurts us. We like to, like, put on this great show for everyone so everyone likes us. Like, we like to take control of it. But we can also be like, oh, I'm so fearful of getting into this school. I'm just not going to apply for it. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, figure out what does God actually want you to do in that fear. How does he want you to have complete courage? History would not be complete without Miriam's courage. And I can't wait to see how the future looks with yours. Point number two, complete worship. Complete worship. Turn with me to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. And in Exodus 2, what we just read, Miriam was about 10 to 12 years old. 
And here, this is around 80 years later. So Miriam is like 90 plus years old. And it, this is so incredible. In Exodus 15, verse 19 to 21, it says, When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang, sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver. He has hurtled into the sea. This is incredible. Guys, they escaped Egypt. Just imagine this moment. Like, they literally, the whole sea part, they run through it. They look back. God's, like, wiping out all their enemies, and they're just, like, sprinting for their lives, trying to get across. It's incredible. And I just imagine 90 plus year old Miriam, right, out there dancing, leading the women in song and in dance with her timbrels. And I just imagine everyone's faces just gleaming, just filled with so, so much joy, so happy. I mean, all those years in slavery, done. They're done. The toil, the pain, being trapped, living in fear then for the first time in your life, you actually have hope. You actually have a positive expectation of the future. They didn't have that before. And they just wanted to worship God. And worship is loving, honoring, celebrating God's power and perfection in gratitude. In gratitude. But we've all been in slavery at one point in our life. And it may not have been physical, but definitely, definitely spiritual. But is our reaction to God saving us still like Miriam? Do we still worship God the way we once did? Turn to Romans 12. In Romans 12, verse 11, it says, Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And I can't help but think about Miriam in this scripture and all the women with her, you know. And I love it because they never were lacking in their zeal. This is what we need to be like. And the key to that is keeping our spiritual fervor. And I looked into it. Because fervor, 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 <laughs> don't know his name. It means an intense and passionate feeling. We have to keep our intense and passionate feeling. We have to keep that, ladies. And I know, I know we don't live by our feelings, but we still have to fight to stay connected to the ones that help us remember where we came from. We still have to fight to stay connected to that. And I've noticed that when I forget everything that God has done for me, I lose my complete worship. I lose my zeal. And baptisms, they're not exciting to me anymore when I get like that. I focus on what everyone else is doing wrong. And I like a quieter service, which is not how it should be. The Bible says never be lacking in zeal, but I, when I'm in that zone, when I forget what God has taken me out from, I start to get annoyed by all the amens and all the, come on, bros, and I'm like, shh, I just want to listen, but no, that's how I know I'm doing bad. I'm like, no, Edie, this is not how it should be. We have to go back to the beginning of our story. We can never forget our Egypt. But most importantly, we can never forget how much God has saved us from. If I didn't become a disciple, I don't even know where I'd be. I'd either be dead in a hole somewhere because that was just the crazy life and I would sometimes end up places where I didn't even know. Or I'd just be alone with no purpose and just living an unfulfilling life. And for me, I became a disciple because I realized even if I get everything I want in life, there's always going to be something else I want. There's always going to be things missing. 
if I had the mindset, if I get my dream dance job, yeah, that's awesome, then what? Find another one, okay, I'll get that one. And then what? I was always like, and then what? There was never an ending. I'm like, and I, am I gonna live the rest of my life just like longing for more things? I knew there had to be something greater out there. So I asked some people why they became disciples. And I just wanna share your, their answers with you. It's so incredible. Donna, <laughs> Donna became a disciple because she always felt like something was missing and so long for love. She always thought that she would have to be what others wanted her to be in order to be loved. And when she studied the Bible, she could not believe that Jesus knew the real her and completely loved her, enough to take all her sins and punishment to give her such an amazing purpose in life. It's beautiful. Marlene, who you just saw, Marlene became a disciple because she came to the conclusion that her life with, was filled with every ounce of self, selfishness, selfishness. And it was no longer worth anything to her. And she wanted to give back to the one who has only ever truly loved her the most, even when she spent her entire life hurting him. Regine became a disciple, these are her words, because it just made sense. <laughs> it sounds like Regine. And I was like, okay, but was there like a moment, Regine, that you like, you know, were at rock bottom? <laughs> and she realized, and she got to the point too, where she saw that nothing else worked, and she was becoming the girls that she used to judge, and she didn't want to become that. And then Carmen. Carmen became a disciple because she was struggling with OCD. And she realized she didn't have the solution to get out of where she was. Only God did. <laughs> I didn't think I got emotional. <laughs> but I'm getting emotional because every one of us has a why. You know, every one of us. But have we forgotten ours? Have we forgotten the why we want to be a disciple? So my challenge for you ladies is in the D group after, please, please share the why. Please share why you became a disciple and why you're so grateful for it. And we have to remember that we need, and we need to focus on this intense and passionate feeling of gratitude, ladies, because we need it to spur us on to be zealous for God. It's not just a zeal like a, come on, bro, come on, sis, because we just want to sound the loudest, but because we're grateful. We're grateful for everything God has done in our lives, and we need to honor God. We need to praise God, and we need to worship him with all of our hearts. We need complete worship. That is what God expects from us, ladies. My third point, third and final point, We've looked at complete courage, complete worship, now complete righteousness. Because something that, when I was studying the Bible, I loved so much about the Bible was that these people messed up. <laughs> they, were perf they weren't perfect. They were perfectly human, <laughs> right? Like they all had sin. They all fell short apart from Jesus, of course. And we get to read a time about this incredible Miriam who has done so many incredible things for God and the Israelites back then, but she too fell short. So we get to look at her life and be inspired, and we can learn from it too. So let's go to Numbers 12. Numbers 12, verse 1, it says, uh, let me know when you guys get there. Hear the pages turning. Okay. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. He, has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. It's a pretty humble thing to say to him. <laughs> At once, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come 
out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. Where there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face clearly and not in riddles he sees from the form of god of the lord sorry when they were not afraid sorry guys I, it's getting hot up here i can't read <laughs> let me go back a little bit verse eight <laughs> don't want to mess up the scriptures verse eight with him i speak face to face clearly and not in riddles he sees the form of the lord why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin became leprous. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned towards her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sins we have so foolishly committed. Do not ha let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, please, God, heal her. So Miriam tanks it a little bit, right? She has her own opinions about how things should be done. And she begins to gossip and slander Moses, God's chosen instrument, because he didn't, she didn't like the girl that he married. And man, reading this and honestly realizing how angry God gets when it comes to gossip and slander is actually very scary. But that's for another lesson, because that would take a long time to go into it. But it's very serious. And God gave Miriam leprosy which was a skin disease back then. And in the Levitical law, if you had leprosy, you had to be put outside the camp because they used to think it was really, really infectious. But God didn't give the leprosy to Aaron. He just gave it to Miriam. Why? Because I think this shows that she was the instigator, right? And Miriam was put outside of the camp for seven days because of her sin, slowing down God's movement of the time. Our sin is serious, ladies. We need to be careful. But I was thinking about the last section in Exodus 15 where Miriam is leading the way in song and dance and worship. And when I think of that, Miriam, I think of like this bright light that just radiates out of her out of her smile, out of her face. But then look where she is now. Why? Because she didn't do what was right by God. And her light was defiled by that skin disease. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be like this Miriam. I want to be like the last Miriam. I want to be radiant. I want to be shining full of joy for God. And I'm going to show you how to do this. In Psalm 37, let's turn there. In Psalm 37, verse 6, in the Amplified Version, because, you know, we are women's midweek. We got to mix it up. It says, he will make your righteousness, your pursuit of understand, sorry, your pursuit of right standing with God like the light and your judgment like the shining of the noon day sun. I love this scripture, ladies. I love it so much. Why? Because first things first, God's going to determine whether you shine or not. God is in control of it, and he's not going to make you shine just because you're you and you're awesome, which you totally are, but he's going to make us shine because of our righteousness, our pursuit, not perfection, but our pursuit of standing right with God. We have to fight for this. Miriam stopped fighting to do what was right by God, and as a result, you saw it on her face. It was an obvious thing. Ladies, what do our faces say about us? 
really, you can tell a lot in someone's walk with God by how their face is. And I remember a moment last year, actually, where my best friend and now my incredible mentor, Ray Jean, <laughs> she's laughing because she knows, <laughs> came up to me and she said, Edie, you've lost your light. She said a lot more, too, which is disclosed. <laughs> but it hurt. It hurt a lot. But I really needed that. I really did. I got to the point, honestly, last year where I stopped making it about God. You know, I made it more about me and my opinions. And I just was like Miriam in this sense. And it defiled me. I put on, tw honestly, I put on 20 plus pounds at that time because I just was eating away my emotions and my sorrows. I wasn't doing good. And I really believe that God chose to dim my light. I really believe that. But I'm grateful for that moment, Regine. Because if Regine couldn't see my light, then how could the world, you know? The world could definitely not see it if it was not evident to a disciple. And the Bible says, without holiness, no one can see God. So without righteousness, no one can see him either because it takes being righteous to be holy. Ladies, do we still have the same light as we once did when we first entered the kingdom? I remember the person who baptized me, Tyler, now Scagliota, I came out of the waters and she goes, you just look so radiant. And I was like, with my like makeup down my face from the water, I was like, yeah? <laughs> because that was God's light. I was the most righteous back then because I was totally pure. But we need to fight for that back now in our lives. Don't hear what I'm not saying. You ladies are all beautiful. So beautiful. There's so many incredibly, beautifully perfect women here. But there's beautiful women in the world too. There is. And we need to be women who radiate God's light. So my challenge is to ask your disciple, how shiny am I? How bright am I looking? How obvious is my light? And your challenge is to take the honest truth, too, because that can be the hard part. <laughs> this isn't going to be fixed with more makeup. This isn't going to be fixed with a better skincare routine, adding five steps to your routine every night. I wish. <laughs> but this is going to be fixed by you pursuing to be completely, completely righteous. So, ladies, we need to have complete courage, we need to have complete worship, and we need to have complete righteousness so that God's will for us and the world can come true. Because remember, it is not complete without you. But hang on, I'm not done. I got a little something. Ashley, you ready? All right, everyone stand up on their feet. We're going to be like Miriam in Exodus 15 now. Thank you so much for letting me share.